All right, so good morning, everybody. This is the most broadcast I've ever been able to say good morning in because we started at 8 Eastern this morning, which is like really early for our California folks as well. Welcome into program number four of seven in this epic March Mammal Madness Festival. So this is the first ever such festival highlighting just the most incredible program ever in its 10th year. As Katie said before we got underway with this, there are like 480,000 kids registered for this program already. More to come certainly after this festival, but that's like the population of Atlanta or like bigger than pretty much all the cities where I am in Canada. So it's really exciting to be able to continue on showcasing such incredible people from across the globe. We've covered genetics. We've covered animal behavior. We found out that a lot of people really don't like lions. That's okay. We talked about a retrospective of some really, really cool stuff over the last nine years and how you can get involved in this festival. And so before we dive in with today's topic, I do want to note two quick things, housekeeping notes. Number one, we've got the magic lib guide. If you guys don't love librarians, you will by the end of this program. Uh, LibGuides are amazing. You can find out all the education resources you ever wanted and some you maybe even didn't. Uh, on the LibGuide at ASU, find out more about how to get involved in March Mammal Madness. And of course, as a partner organization today for this festival, I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we do 40 plus broadcasts like this every single month with scientists and explorers around the world. We're all about conservation, adventure, and science. And so it's such a thrill to get the chance to partner with the amazing March Mammal Madness team for today's program. So as I said, we've covered a lot of science today, but one of the things that really sets March Mammal Madness apart is its emphasis, its collaboration with artists. Art and science are meant to be together. For some of our students today, you will know STEAM as an acronym, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art and Mathematics. Don't just say STEM, it's boring, art's really cool. It makes it so much more engaging. Now personally, a stick person is the best thing that I can draw. I am not that creative a person, but that is why we've got Karen Henning and Will Nickley with us today. who are gonna blow our minds and talk about some of the amazing work that they have done to make March Mammal Madness such a success. And as just an extra bonus, we've also got <laughs> founder of the whole shebang, the March Mammal Madness. So we've got like a really, yeah, we, this, is more, this is not done that often. So Karen, thank you for doing that as part of your self <laughs> Uh, but welcome in, everybody. And so I'm so excited to have you here. Katie, I'm going to pop you in every now and then just for fun, and you can, like, do jump scares with people. Okay, perfect. But Karen and Will, thank you so much for being here, and I'm so excited to dive in with art. So tell me a little bit about the backstory. How you got involved in this program? Were you involved since the get-go? Is it the last little bit? And why is it so important to emphasize this amazing program with such great art? Karen, do you want to take us? Sure. Um... <laughs> I discovered March Mammal Madness through the hashtag, I think it was year two. Um, that was the year that, that Walter, the uh, Indrakathir, was competing. And uh, the, the whole thing just captured my imagination. And I, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if uh, a group of us who were really interested in this just drew the competitors and, and had a, a big bracket on the wall like we see are going up on a lot of walls of a lot of the schools that participate and then as the animal advance we could literally move them along the wall and we could send pictures screenshots of that and uh and put the hashtag on it and um that's how it started and reaching out to Katie and telling her I had a small group of artists who would be interested in drawing the bracket. And uh, she was 100% on board with that. And the next year we we started with art of all of the combatants. That's beautiful. And Katie, way to go for appreciating great art. You've got some behind you as well. Like this is the essence of this and that's so exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. We were, when, when Karen messaged me and was like, so would you be, and I was like, yes, that would be amazing. <laughs> like, art, like, you know, you, you photographs are great. They're fantastic. Video is great. But like, sometimes you don't get the exact kind of thing you want to capture for, for, for people's imagination. And like the artistic contributions to scientific understanding cannot be overstated right like we know that humans have made art of animals for at least thirty-five thousand years we see it on on cave paintings and so like bringing bringing the art into the madness was like one of the best level ups that we that, that the tournament's ever done 
Fantastic. Thank you, too, for that beautiful intro. By the way, I, I want to highlight Kay Paintings, the Lasso Kay Paintings in France. Amazing. Uh, Katie has some Aborigine art behind her. And so, again, Australia has some of the, one of the, the longest continuous culture in the world. Some of the artistic representations they have of some of the wildlife there are unbelievable. Honestly, finish this broadcast, and you, for the first time, you actually don't have a broadcast right after this. Go check out some of this art. It's unbelievable. It'll blow your mind. Some of my favorite stuff in the world. Will, or Pre Professor Will, we've got a lot of professors today. This is very exciting for me. I feel very fancy. Um, how did you get involved with us? What's your backdrop? Yeah, well, thanks, Jesse. Um, like like so many of us, I came to March Mammal Madness as, as a fan. Uh, I saw it on Twitter back when Twitter was even more an active thing be before Instagram and, and some of the other ones took took over a little bit. Um, and uh, as, as a designer, I, I got a bunch of the folks I, I worked with at the time into this alternate, uh, maybe even the best March Madness activity. Uh, we saw the bracket. And as maybe many designers might tell you, it's hard for us to leave, leave things alone. And the, bra the bracket that we were using at the time uh, was something we wanted to tweak. We wanted to make it a little more readable. And uh, I went ahead and redid the bracket. And, and actually, uh, I think I like at tweeted Katie and said, hey, here's another version of the bracket if, if it's useful. And, uh, and I think you kind of took it and ran, and, and I've been invited to, to help. Again, my, my role in March Mammal Madness is so small. All I do is kind of lay out the bracket. Um, but I, I, it, you know, one advantage it gives me is I get to see all the animals before anyone else does. <laughs> uh, don't tell me one. The essence of excitement. I didn't know that going in, Katie. <laughs> yeah, no, and I and and Will was so nice. I mean, because like the bracket we used to have, I made on PowerPoint. It was so janky, <laughs> and Will was so nice. He's like, I just I would like on behalf of all graphic designers everywhere, <laughs> and everybody that has to look at this. We would like to help you. <laughs> it was so nice. It was so it was delivered so well. But like I think Will's understating how important the bracket is, like and the layout and how thoughtfully and gorgeous. And he switches the wow. the fonts every year and he showcases different font designers. And over the years we now have, you know, we have the the common names bracket, we have the Latin binomial bracket, we have it in Espanol, we have it um in jumbo size. So you can print it out in four sheets of paper for people that want to put it up on their wall big. Or for little kids who have bigger writing, it makes it it makes it work for everyone. And and so like the the and and I also want to say it's not a graphic design, but um, Jessica Light has been doing a screen reader bracket for a few years now too. And so like the you know, I you know I my part's very small. I do a bracket. It's like no, this is this is part of the beating heart of the tournament. And and both Karen and Will I think showcase how full of love for the tournament people are and they're and they see where it can be grown and 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 more accessible and built better and and they come with their talents and their skills and and it's so special for people to say i think this could help and i want to help do it and and this is what we love so much about this tournament year after year the way it's leveled up because the community is just full of talent and love well, that was delightful. Holy will, Karen, did you think, I mean, like you came for the kids, but now Katie just like the the epic praise to lay in. That was really sweet. Um, and, and it is a word, I love that you mentioned fonts too. This is so weird, but like topography is really important. If you look at how companies do, if you look at things in the world, how a font can be aggressive or friendly or nice, people pick up on that. I'm honestly, I have your bracket up on the side of my screen and it's fantastic. So I, again, the care that you guys put into this, the joy you have for this is so palpable. And so again, everyone check out the lib guide. You can see some of that amazing art. I also want to ask a quick question. You talked about Walter the Andricothere. Like, <laughs> is there art of this somewhere that I can find? Because I want it. Like, I'm so excited. Everyone should know what an Andricothere is at the coolest. Um, <laughs> let me know after the fact. Okay. Um, Katie, I'm going to put you in the background for that fun jump scare thing later. For the two of you, okay, we do all these programs with cool scientists. We had animal behavior, we had genetics. People ask, what's your favorite animal to zoologists? And they're just like, I don't have a favorite animal. So for, for you two, what is your favorite thing to draw? I have to put you on the spot. Um, Will, you're on the top of the screen. You go first. Go first. Oh, man. That, that is quite on, on the spot. Uh, the favorite thing to draw is the thing I've been, you know, asked to draw most recently. Usually, it's always a challenge, and in, in, in design, and I'd imagine in, in art as well. Um, often, 
the the thing you're asked to draw, or, or in the case of like March Mammal Badness, uh, uh, drawing an animal or something animal-like, it might be the first time I've ever had to draw something. And and a big part of, of drawing it well or finding a way to enjoy it is is uh, just drawing it awfully the first 10 times and, and, and kind of feeling your way around what your subject matter is. And, and that's, that, that can be a really intimidating process. And it's something um, as a teacher, I try to help break down for my design students. And it can also be really enjoyable. So I, I actually, when I heard that uh, there's going to be a little drawing activity later today, I'm excited to, to, to try it out and, and show you just how, how awful we all draw at first. <laughs> We're all excited. We've all got our papers ready. That's so exciting. Will, well, thank you for that. What a beautiful answer. Karen. <laughs> oh, favorite, favorite thing to draw, favorite animal. This is the question that we all dread as yeah. artists and designers. <laughs> it's also the question we respond to with, I'm so glad you asked that. That's a wonderful question. <laughs> I usually tell people it's the animal I'm drawing next. So very similar to uh, Will's sentiment. Um, I will say that through the tournament, I have found that the animals that I look at on the bracket and go, oh, I don't think I want to draw that, have come to be the ones that I do a 180 on. And now I seek them out because I learn so much by taking on art around an organism that is initially not appealing or just downright intimidating. Um, I can, I think I can, the brackets out there, I am, I am on the Dobson fly this year because I have had Dobson fly experiences that are um, a little bit skeevy. So I figured this would be my, my nod to the Dobson fly. Okay. Um, and now I know the ones that scared me were, were the, uh, the males. So um, <laughs> I need to not be worried at all. So learn something new. If you, if you're learning, you're winning. It's totally well, I think to add maybe too about uh, drawing the next thing, and I love that you brought this up uh, about you know seeking out the animals that maybe you're least familiar with. Uh, one thing we talk about a lot in in design is is the idea of form and function, and this relates a lot to the natural sciences as well. Creatures of the critters in March Mammal Madness have form, right? Their their bodies and their behaviors have a form that is there for, for a very specific evolutionary purpose. And as an artist or a designer, when you are asked to draw something, you, you kind of are forced to slow down and understand the form of, of a critter in a way that maybe you wouldn't if you just glanced at something in nature. So we are, you know, we're confronted with those uh, interesting teeth or those weird body segments or that uh, that pattern on the outside, uh, on the fur or something of an animal. And, and it gives us a new way to question our understanding of that animal and how it interacts with its environment, its, its, its biosphere. So I, I think art is an, a very approachable way to engage nature. And it's something that, that is exciting about drawing you know, natural things. Well, so Karen, I'll bring you both in for this, just to say like, and Katie, you can agree with this, you've watched everything or been involved today. You guys are the most eloquent of our group, okay? Like, I love the geneticist and animal behaviorists, but you guys, like, I mean, you live and breathe this stuff. This is very exciting. By the way, so I've been trying to come up with a different title for every broadcast. We had uh, Desert, uh, Snack Bar of the Desert was an animal behavior. Uh, and, oh, geez, genetics, what did we just have? It was, I forget, but weird body segments might be the one for this one so far. We're only in the we <laughs> got lots of time. It's very good. Um, I have a, a great question, actually, from a speaker from our last broadcast. Jessica wants to know, What's your process? Like, what? how do you go about to, like doing the work that you do? Karen, if you want to kick us off? Yeah. Sure. Um, the first thing I do is uh, research. And um, I will tell you this, all of you interested out there in doing artwork uh, that is scientifically accurate, Google is not your friend, <laughs> at least not for the first two or three pages. Um, you really have to go in deep and make sure that the reference that you get in that initial search is accurate. And from there, um, I look at papers that are cited. 
Um, if I can't get to a certain paper because my credentials are not tied in to, to make it available to me, I have a wonderful resource in Katie and everybody else on March Mammal Madness, and, and I can ask them to pull the paper for me. Um, for things like uh, extinct organisms, we can uh, use museum specimens. Um, there is uh, a program right now that is in full swing to digitize museum collections, and that includes the, the fossil collections and the, uh, the, the osteological collections. And those help us out a lot. Being able to look at something in a 3D file and turn it around has been uh, an amazing uh, thing to have access to uh, as the, the tournament has, has gone on. Just all of these things that we have found in terms of resources that are that are still becoming available has been a really exciting part of the tournament for me. So my process is a little different every year, yeah. um, but it starts with the Google search and then it starts with refining that search immediately. And then we build from there. Fantastic. Uh, Will, before we go to you, just really quick, Allison noted, again, so many Google images are mislabeled. I love the, you guys are the best YouTube audience of all time. Katie, actually, I'll bring everybody in so that we can have people ask Like, seriously, of anything we've ever done as an organization, no group of YouTubers has ever been more involved or crazy than the March Mammal Madness folks, which is a testament to all the work that you all put in. So thank you for this as a, as a, a fan as well as a host. It's been a ton of fun. And by the way, Jessica noted that the second broadcast genetics was Grody DNA. Yes, <laughs> tagline. Will, what's your process? Is it different from Karen's? Is it uh, very similar? Well, I I think maybe it's it's different, but I if I'm thinking about my process for helping lay out the bracket, it's because it's a different task, right? I I I haven't been an illustrator for March Mammal Madness, at least not yet. Maybe it's something I can participate in one of these future years. Uh, but I can talk about that a little bit. Um, one one thing that is very important in, uh, I guess, in graphic design, if we're thinking about it that way, um, is making sure the information that's that's on the page about the bracket is is readable and accessible to the people that will use the bracket. And uh, and one thing that we talked about just for half a second was you know choosing a font or or a typeface for the bracket, which uh, if if <laughs> well, I guess. If you're someone who is into that, you know that that's one of the most daunting tasks and it's easy to spend several hours finding a typeface or a font that matches everything you want it to be. The spirit of the competition, the readability at the scale uh, that our brackets are printed. Um, and, and a big part of the process there is uh, choosing things you know, as I lay out the bracket and printing them out and putting them up on the wall at different scales, just like people are going to be doing in 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 real life, right? Our users, right, the, the folks who are, are playing along in March Mammal Madness are going to be using the graphic design. So we, we need to make sure that, that we test it, right? We, we prototype it. And and I guess in, in a word, prototyping is a big part of, of my process from a design perspective. Uh, two things about this, actually, I'm going to bring this up really quick for everybody so people can see this bracket. Again, go to that libguide and you can see it uh, much more closely and you can see it in all sorts of sizes. Uh, it's not the best as it pops up here, but it's beautiful. I mean, I saw this the other day and that was one of my first things about it. The choice of color, the fun merch and madness being curved. Like, it's just, it's a delight to witness. Uh, so thank you for, for taking such care of it and it really does shine. By the way, Will, you also pulled off a great thing because it's always an opportunity in a fun, casual thing like this to throw forth an idea like, hey, I'd love to help draw with the people who can help make that decision. And I mean, I know they did it because of your skill, but also they're totally in it and no one can like reject you in a broadcast, which is great. It's not really like, no, Will, I'm not sure that's gonna happen. So well done, well played, sir. Um, so I'm, I'm I, I guess, Personally, one of the questions we've been asking this whole time, I know we're going to do a drawing demonstration today. We're going to uh, all sorts of YouTube questions. So I wanted to get this done early. Do you personally, both of you, have a favorite in this year's competition? Now, uh, the first group of the day, Katie's original one, we're all, they were all, there's so much equivocation. It was like, oh, they're all nice. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. We all want like hard. They're all champions in their niche. 
<laughs> is the Iberian really a champion? Are we sure? I'm not sure. Uh, no, all great animals, of course. I, I've been stressing all day long. For those who watched, Team Sentient Pinecone, Pangolins all the way. That's my oh. pick. Nothing can beat them, and I can. I'll fight that to the death. I mean, there's no animal on this list or lichen that can compete with my pangolin. But Will, do you have a, a favorite? What's what jumps out for you? No pressure. Yeah, no, I don't feel pressure. This is one of the the best parts of this tournament is you get to pick and choose a little bit. Um, although I am partial to bats, right? The mammal who made it, the one who can fly. I think this year, um, I you know, one way I look at all the animals is is through my profession, my discipline of design, and design is is something that arguably animals do as well, right? You've got animals who who build things. You have animals who uh, put on displays. Uh, you have animals who uh, make plans for for how to use you know other objects as tools. And 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 in many senses, those are those are manifestations of design in the animal world. So uh, there, one animal that caught my eye this year would be uh, the the romp of otters in the mammal collectives. And and if we know, I, I don't know. I'm sure many of our folks who who play March Mammal Madness have seen how otters can make plans and work together uh, and also use tools to, to, to hunt and to um, like find food and, and crack open things. So uh, again, that's my very unscientific <laughs> knowledge of, of what otters can do. But, but yeah, there's, there's a little bit of designer in them. And so I, I think the romp of otters is my favorite for this year. Very cool. And it's a great name too. But I will stress on that note, so sea otters are known to do this. They'll take rocks, they'll take clamshells, and they'll crack the rock into the clamshell to break it. Which again, like up until I was fairly old and, and I'm a huge animal nerd, like that was news to me. The idea that a lot of animals use tools, a lot of intelligent birds use tools, tons of mammals. We're seeing this across the animal kingdom. It's one of the things that we used to think really differentiated us from other animals. And it's so cool to see that it's such a, a common practice, so to speak. You mentioned design both in body and in the design things make. I encourage everyone, when you're done this broadcast, look up Birds of Paradise and Bowerbirds. If you have not seen yeah, this, Bowerbird. before, Northern Australia, New Guinea, just will blow your mind. Like they're just the most amazing creatures on this. Uh, it's one of the few small things that I would travel around the world to see. Like I would go to New Guinea to see Birds of Paradise because they're such a special group of animals. So thank you for that, Will. Uh, Karen, oh, what do you have in your hand? Oh, yes. Just me. <laughs> oh, I you had Never mind. <laughs> the tattoos, I thought you had something physically in your hand. But there you go. What is your pick? No pressure. Again. I try really hard not to have a pick um, because I want to give all of these combatants my, my equal know. attention. But uh, uh, the, the romp of otters, those of you who oh. are doing search on the, uh, the bracket will will find out just how brave they are and they do not have to be in large numbers to be so you're going to find out some really interesting things um the conspiracy of lemurs just for the name of them, i'm i i jumped on that immediately so um um yeah the collectives for me have my heart this year i mean the wisdom of wombats how can you ever who knew that before this it's amazing. Okay. Just so great. And the embarrassment of pandas. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting to see the artwork for that. I am so excited. <laughs> Katie, what were you going to oh, chime in? I, I was just going to clarify that the otters um, this year are not sea otters. They are smooth coated otters mm -hmm. um, um, from Eurasia. And so they're, so, um, so do research on the specific species and in the collective group because we wanted to fit the the full collective name because we're featuring this quirk of English um, that dates back 500 plus years at least. Um, we we didn't we didn't always we weren't always able to fit in the specific Latin binomial. So the glaring of cats is the black footed cat. Um, and, and so kind of digging in and seeing exactly what these species are um, could be the difference of how much, you know, what, what traits that animal brings to bear. And I also want to highlight that, um, that, that these kinds of quirks of English uh, or other kinds of things that we've done have really opened up opportunities for the art team to get creative. So a few years ago, um, we had a division called Mammal of the Nouns and Mammals of the Nouns were mammals that had their common name was just like, you know, volcano rabbit or sea otter or mountain goat. And instead we were presenting them as 
goat of the mountain and otter of the sea. And, um, and it, you know, it gives them so much more dignity in their name um, when you, you know, wallaby of the swamp. And, uh, and so it was really fun to do that. And, and Karen for that, that division created like, like, um, uh, like, um, what am I, why am I blanking on the term for this? The um, heraldry shields. Yeah, they had they had like their shields and and crests and like these very kind of Elizabethan style accoutrement in their artwork and and their their family shield had some of their um, key physical traits like spines or hooves or canines or, or or those kinds of attributes and it was just it was really wonderful to have science and and language arts and visual arts all come together in some of these divisions. I'm so glad you mentioned this. So there's a creature, it's extinct, and it was a type of raptor, and it was called Eoraptor, and it was found in southern Argentina. And so if you do its Latin name and you translate it, it's the Dawn Hunter from the Valley of the Moon, which is the greatest name of all time. I, I, I can, anyone, no one can beat that, okay? Try try your best. Um, by the way, YouTube's done crazy, as usual. So we've got, in terms of picks, we've got Woohoo Bats. We've got Bat Lobby <laughs> working. We've got Go Team Rob of Botter. So Rob, you guys, I'm, you're the first duo to pick the same species. We've got a lot of bat people. And then we've got a comment that truly, I have literally hosted over 1,000 programs on this platform. And I never thought this would be a question that we get. So thank you, Jessica, uh, past speaker. We talked about engineering structures. Didn't think that was ever going to be a thing that was going to come up, but I appreciate how strange this gets all the time. Um, we're going to go into our drawing demonstration in just a minute. I want to make sure we get as much time as possible for that. We can all play along together. Uh, but a quick question from uh, one of the teachers, Katie. Wanted to be clear, the mammal collectives are competing as a group. Yes, so it's several otters versus several lemurs. So that's a fantastic question, and it is. Um, it encourages you to read the fine print on the LibGuide. So yes, they um, they will arrive at the encounter battle scene um, in whatever kind of situation they come together as. So for like a pride of lions, we know lionesses. We know a pride of lionesses. They hunt together. They they hang out. They nap. They they are a social group. They're cohesive and they coordinate in their hunting tactics. All right, other kinds of animals, because these noun, these collective nouns are a quirk of English, they get assigned to animals that aren't necessarily good at being social, right? So they could be solitary animals that encounter others just during the mating season or just when they're raising young or um, just when they're at their territorial boundary and they get into a skirmish with their neighbor. Like, this is the line don't cross it. And so in that situation, we have to think like, okay, are they all going to be adults? Are they going to be as likely to turn on each other or even be more focused on each other than they are their supposed opponent or adversary in the bracket? And so doing some research about whether these animals are social or solitary and what they would be doing with other members of their species in the month of March is part of that. And, and it's going to depend on what hemisphere. So March in the Northern Hemisphere, of course, is spring, but March in the Southern Hemisphere is fall. And so, right, so we get like, uh, in, sorry, I'm totally nerding out about the science, but we pay attention to moon cycles, tide tables, um, ambient temperature, and, and all sorts of those things, they get brought in. So, um, so, you know, kind of think about what does it mean to be a collective in an actual natural science sense, which may not align greatly with this quirk of English language. So Mike, we think the orca is gonna beat the common prawn, but maybe it's the king tide and it just wakes them up right up on the beach and the prawn just laugh all the way, no? Well, I and mean, there's a question there, right? So that's a different division. That's the queens of the sea and sky. That's and true. in that situation, um, you, you would want to think about um, the, the the worst ranked species, which has the higher number, it's counterintuitive, blame basketball. Um, like we, um, the, the worst ranked species has to go to the habitat of the better ranked species in the first three rounds. So that means that whoever's fighting the orca for the first three rounds, orca's number one in that, in that division, they're all gonna be on orca's turf. Once you get out to the elite trait, the final roar and the championship, well, the habitat is randomized among four pre-announced potential habitats. Montane forest, kelp forest, Ooh. savanna, or sea ice. 
So one of the things you have to think about is, you know, what are the probability that they're going to be in a habitat that's favorable or disfavorable to them? And how might that be favorable or disfavorable to their opponents, right? Are they equally handicapped? Or are they unequally handicapped? It's all, it's almost like this tournament's designed to make people think in multiple contingencies and integrate <laughs> complex information for learning. <laughs> there we are. Very cool. Thank you for diving into the science, Katie. And Karen, we're going to go into the drawing demonstration one quick second, but I did need to ask one more thing of Will before we do that, which is it looks like you have like a vertebrae, like a full spine on top of the thing over there. What is that thing on top of your board? <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, let me let me grab a couple things. So okay. right, right. As 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 a designer, uh, we make, my students make things, and some of the stuff up on the wall behind me are oh. printed chair prototypes and some cast wax cast uh, um, candles, believe it or not. So they're they're used for teaching different processes, like like how to make and prototype things. Yeah, that, that's that's all they are. Always happy to share this kind of stuff. Yeah, but, very yeah. cool, man. Well, thank you for that. Um, Karen, let's bring up your screen share. I want to do this demo. You can explain a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. And then I encourage all our groups tuning in on live uh, to join in as well. I do want to do a special shout out to Ms. Jurichich's class too. So Buckeyes, you guys have been in like every program today, which is yeah. great. So Metro Early College Middle School, Ohio State's campus. We love you guys. Thank you so much for continuing to join us. Uh, but Karen, what are we, what's going on today? Tell us more. I wanted to take a closer look at the cheetah. We, we had Ann Hilborn earlier talking about cheetahs and I figured this was a great lead in. Um, the first thing I do is I look for reference. I look for all kinds of reference on markings, on what the, the coloring is. Um, I also look at where these animals live and um, try to make some determinations about why they look the way that they do. Now, here's the challenge with the, the cheetah is that you already have in your head that this is a, a big cat and, and cat is a very loaded word with, um, it's just laden with imagery and um, assumptions because we have cats in our lives. We, we keep them as pets, we have them as companions. We think we know what this animal should look like. And if you look at an actual cat in relation to it, you would be horribly mistaken. So starting from a place of cheetahs not looking like cats, I think what I wanna do is look a little bit at how to, first of all, let me get the right brush up here, look a little bit into how I want to present the animal. And I think I'm gonna do profile. Okay, so this is just based on some of the reference that I have and the ears not pointy like a cat's, but rounded. Mm. And this becomes important when you think about how they live and hunt, because you, you don't want, if you're a runner, you don't want to have huge ears that will drag in the wind. Um, but you still need ears to pinpoint where your prey is, where it's coming from. So the thing with the, the cheetah is the ears are small enough that they can lay them back when they're in full sprint. So, okay, so I have what I think is a reasonable guess here based on what I know about cheetahs from that photo and them not looking like cats. Um, let me bring up an actual profile. We'll flip that over, we'll see how close I got. Yeah, not close at all, look at that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to position this so the top of the head is flat, like our profile there, and I'll see very quickly that the muzzle is in completely the wrong place. This is why they make erasers. <laughs> and this is, this is one of the most important things I do is figure out that everything that I did before is not correct and be willing to go back in and correct it. Uh, because now 
I'm thinking about, well, why does this animal's head look this way? And the thing that I'm noticing front and center right now is this brow, because I'm looking at relation to the ear, the top of the head and the brow is very, very pronounced. So I will put that in, and then we have the muzzle coming down from there. Let me move him out of the way. And it's not a very long muzzle at all. Not, uh, it, it's certainly not long like a dog's or like a bear's, but it's, we're, we're in territory now that it's distinctly not cat. Now, if I had had this outline presented to me and I was told to figure out what animal this was, cat would not be my guess, not at all. But this is one of the grand things about doing illustration for science and for this tournament in particular, is I would never have known the wonder that is the facial construction of a cheetah in the way that I do now without having to have sat down and actually drawn it. Um, I was extremely curious as to the structure of the face and there was, uh, I got some answers to that at a, in a later tournament where we had an Andean mountain cat as part of the tournament. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. They have the cat like ears, but they've got that flat head and that, that brow that big brow that's coming down. So what do these two animals have in common that they would share this structure? Um, and the answer is it shades the eyes from the light. You've got the cheetah out in this open savanna area and you, you shade your eyes when you need to see far. And the Andean cat not only has that same challenge, it's doing it in snow. So the reflection back is even greater and that brow is even more pronounced in that animal. So just wanted to point that out because that's the kind of nerdery that I think is really, really cool. So the eye ends up being set way back. What you can do with eyes actually, because they're always bigger than you think they are. And it looks a little crazy, but you put the eyeball in there first, and then you figure out where the lid is in relation to it. So now we have that forward facing eye. That has the protective lids around it. And when we get into markings and in fur, we will be giving more shape to that brow. I tend to make eyes on things very, very large off, off the gate. And that is something that I double check myself on a lot. Uh, I love drawing eyes, but sometimes the size of that eye just gets a little too much. So we have to resize. So now we have a little bit of a back to the ear, the back of the head. We have, a, it looks like an eyelash on the other side. This is the other thing about cheetahs that's pretty awesome is that when you get close into the face, you can see the, uh, the great eyelashes. And again, this is something like you have um, in several sports that are played on open fields, you will have players that have uh, black grease paint beneath their eyes to mitigate the reflection of the sun or of snow because some sports are played in snow. And it is for the same reason um, that these, these black markings beneath the eyes appear so frequently for animals like this. I know we're on a limit of time, so I'm going to go in and start doing some markings. Well, this is so cool. We can skip lunch and all our other broadcasts if you'd like. <laughs> and again, we see the line of the nose 
is in line with the top of the head. So, and this is the first cat-like feature that we've really seen is that triangular nose. So now we have an animal that, that is definitely looking like a cheetah, but definitely not looking like a cat. <laughs> so if you went in to render a cheetah thinking this is a cat, it's going to bog down very, very quickly. And this is why using reference is so important, especially in the sciences. It needs to reflect your subject accurately. And it is a lot of work. It is a lot of research. It is totally worth it to get it right in the end, because the amount that you learn from doing this kind of work is profound. Um, the fact that I am still talking about cheetahs not looking like cats, per se, should be an indicator of how hard I nerd out on this stuff and how important it is. Now, there, when it comes to extinct organisms and rendering those, um, you're working with limited materials and uh, you're working mostly from papers. And there are going to be a lot of different opinions about what you may have been asked to draw. And it's great to have opinions that differ from the people who are, are commissioning you to draw that, but you cannot let those opinions obscure what is in writing and what is in fact and what they want you to present. Um, you, you gotta look at what the bones tell you first and not come from a place of emotion, which is hard because I think most of us grew up loving dinosaurs and uh, it's, it's hard to not have an emotional response to that. But uh, having done reconstruction on several types of extinct organisms, um, it, it's always gratifying when you see that animal looking back at you from the sketches that you have been have been working on um so just follow the research follow the research follow what the bones tell you follow what they tell you about the anatomy and it i promise it is one of the most rewarding things that you will ever do yeah and this is wonderful I'm, I'm gonna, I'm curious actually, one of the questions we got while you're still drawing a little bit, uh, Commander Orion wants to know what tools you're using. So of course, like the three of us are doing this with paper and pencil, you can do this with crayons, you can do this with any number of things. What's the specific thing that you're using for anyone who wants to go online and do this after the broadcast? I am using Procreate on the iPad Pro. Um, it has done a lot to change the way that I do my initial drawings, because as you can see, it's fairly, makes it fairly easy to do things with shape ooh, ooh. and distance. So like, I'm not really happy with the length on this muzzle, so I can, that, that is... looks a little more right to me now. Wicked. So, but to do that without the the digital, you can certainly do it. Um, I went through reams and reams and reams of tracing paper early on, and I still have some of those stacks because you would just you would put a new piece of tracing paper down, make the adjustments, and if that wasn't right, new piece of tracing paper goes down. You make the adjustments again, uh, but what you end up with in in the end is almost this flip book of the entire process that it took you to get to the end result, which is an accurate representation of the species that you're illustrating. Um, and that, that can be really valuable to have. Um, for, for me, it, it's helped me route out uh, some, some visual biases on how I think things should look. Yeah, if you think there's a way that things should look, mm -hmm. <laughs> try drawing a pronghorn. You will find out very quickly that those eyes, that nose, those those horns are not where you think they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's you really need to look closely at that and look at the shape first and forget for a moment that you're drawing 
a cheetah, an antelope, an elephant. Look at the shapes, look at the relation to each other. Like I will be looking at, I'm looking at this distance. I'm looking at this distance. I'm looking at the fact that this here is a shape, but it's a slightly different shape than here. Yep. And the brow is one shape into itself. If you take the whole head, you're looking almost at a square. Yeah. I've always loved in Disney illustration where they talk about everything starts with a circle. But that was such a neat thing. And, and I, I'm so glad Will's nodding his head when you're talking about the reams of, of tracing paper. And I love this about artists that, it, you know, we've got people in the chat saying things like, like I'm saying internally, which is, you know, there's a reason I didn't go into art. Oh my God, my cheetah. And I mean, if you look at mine, I had to illustrate that he's a cheetah by writing meow above his face. Or, or, <laughs> right? That helps me. Then I'll remember that that's what I was trying to do. Um, and so for, for our audience today, it doesn't need to be brilliant. You know, a lot of us, certainly Karen and Will, you two were drawing from when you were very young, correct? Right? Like this is not something that you started late in life. You were always interested in art. And so if you're young, you know, you can suck for a really long time and that's okay. Like the whole essence of this is to fail miserably again and again and again. And if you're interested in it, if you're vested in it, keep at it. And you can end up doing things like this incredible cheetah that we've had the chance to see come into, you know, to life today. Um, which I think is a really important message, one we're not going to get in our other broadcast today quite as much. So thank you so much for this, uh, Karen and Will. Absolutely. Oh, Will, unmute your mic. Sorry, you are chatting with us. That's okay. I think I did it to you. There we go. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, I had a question and maybe something to add and, and maybe something our artists can comment on further. So the, the type of art that, that uh, our artists are doing for March Memo Madness is and maybe illustration is, is a really good word for it too um really needs to find a way to accurately represent our understanding of of these the species that are a part of march mammal madness um but that's not the only thing art can do right uh, one way that i've heard art described is uh like creative self-expression as well and my question for our artist is because there's such a need to accurately visually represent the like the features of the animals in our tournament where is there still room for you to to be creative in in this process because certainly there is room and I, I'm, I'm just curious where that comes into play there is certainly wiggle room stylistically if you have an animal um i'm thinking i think it was two years ago um Olivia had a species of weasel with this brilliant red coat. And she did a version of that, which was entirely accurate in terms of proportion, coloring, uh, ratio of foot to head, eye distance. But she did it in a style that looked like it was rendered in stained glass, which is really, really beautiful. It translates well to prints. It translates well to things like enamel prints, stickers. These are the things we think about as artists as well, um, especially those of us who are selling merch. Um, but that that illustration was entirely accurate. It was just highly stylized. And uh, I encourage uh, the team to make stylistic choices, but they have to be under the umbrella of that scientific accuracy. It's a, a great question, Will. Thank you for that. And a beautiful answer. I really, I, I just looked at elephant art just as a perfect example. And any species that's your favorite, if you want to go to the bracket, find a species that's your favorite, type its name in. Munt Jack. I don't know if there's going to be a lot of Munt Jack art out there, but if you pick one of the more common creatures and type in art, you'll see hundreds of different kinds of ways of conveying it. Some of them are a little too stylized for the scientific accuracy that we've been talking about today, but it's beautiful to see. And it, it's so, so... Uh, important to note that you can come at this from so many different angles. And I, I think, again, this has been such a fun program. We could go all day, but technically we are at the end of the broadcast. And so what I want to make sure that we do, again, for anyone who did a drawing, I'm going to share this on Twitter in a minute, um, but please share your drawing. 2022 MMM. If you want to tag the MMM Let's Go uh, epic extravaganza Twitter page, there's so many great people there. We'd love to see your artwork. Um, again, meow and that really helps a lot so i'm going to put that on twitter because i have no shame um thank you so much for our great commentary and will and jared Karen, uh this is it's been so fun to see you in action to hear from you about all this i hope we've inspired a lot of people to think about science in an artistic way and certainly this amazing mark Mammal madness tournament 
I will do one quick last housekeeping note that if anyone wants to learn more, see more of that art, get involved, check out those wicked awesome fonts, LibGuides, LibGuides are the best. They're created by librarians and those people are the best. And we just have the, the best time f featuring this amazing uh, March Mail Madness extravaganza. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. Karen Will, is there a last message you want to leave our kids with today about art, no pressure at all? Um, yeah, Will. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> Katie and I were really like, what, what are you going to do? Will, take us away. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, I would say find, find a way, especially if you already have, have you've caught the bug to, to do art. Um, I, I think find a way to be excited about the animals that you get to learn about this 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 go round with March Mammal Madness. It might mean drawing them. It might mean doing some more research as, about not just behavior, but all of the different ways that these animals look. And and it's okay to be creative because I think as as we've shared with you today. Uh, as you're being creative with your representation, with how you draw or you know express these animals, you're going to learn things about them. So just find a way to make it fun for you. Well, that's a beautiful answer. And on that note, I've just done my leaf slug because Mark talked about it. This is my leaf slug, and I think you know I've learned a lot about it. He's got the googly eyes. He's got the long thin body. I could put like a little slime trail. We'll figure that out later. And again, I hope all our people get a chance to use it on art. <laughs> Karen, is there a last message you have for everybody today? Yes, if you are drawing something and you are learning new things about it, the people who look at your drawing down the line are also going to learn new things about it. You are doing science by doing art. Don't let anybody tell you that being artistic means you cannot do work in science or do good science. It's, it's all connected. It's all a manner of learning. It's all a method of communication. So draw on. That's beautiful. Um, we, we could end so beautifully there. Katie, you look like you're like the most enthusiastic audience member of all time. Do you want to like <laughs> un unmute? Come on in. Like, I mean, this has been so much fun. So thank I, you for being no, Everything that Will and Karen said just like brought tears to my eyes. And I think draw on is the most beautiful thing ever. And, um, and, and, and art and science belong together. And I'm really, really excited that uh, they've brought their talents and their perspective and their genius and their enthusiasm to Marshmallow Madness. It's made it so much better. And, um, and I hope that this becomes a model for all sorts of science engagement everywhere, that um, it's just not going to be what it could be if it doesn't have artists and graphic designers and um, a, an incredibly amazing, diverse collective of skilled artisans. So thank you for all of your contributions. Thank you so, so much, everybody. Uh, we'll end it there for our live audience. We want to see your drawings. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we're so excited as we continue this festival. In just another hour, three more amazing programs to come. I must admit, I'm pretty biased towards art and design, just like Katie obviously is. Uh, Karen and Will, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye for thank you. Time.